Well, greetings and salutations, test takers. This is the Series 7 Guru, a.k.a. Dean Tenney, coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas for our Tuesday weekly community live stream Q&A. Uh, tell us what series exam you're taking uh, and where you're joining us from. If you have a question, we're here primarily to handle content questions, but if you we're also here for fun and fellowship. So if you do have a question, uh, put it in a format where I can pick it out of the chat uh, more readily. So if you're taking like the SIE or Series 7, put what exam you're taking followed by a Q and then your question. And that helps me distinguish, you know, uh, test takers who are chatting amongst themselves versus, uh, you know, somebody who has a content question. Uh, a couple of housekeeping details and we'll get underway. Uh, I am teaching a Series 66 next week, March 18th through 20th. Uh, I do co-branded classes uh, with Kaplan. I'm not a Kaplan employee, but Kaplan hires my LLC, me, uh, to do uh, joint classes. And I'm doing that uh, for the 66 next week. Uh, April, I'll be doing uh, April 8th and 10th, an SIE class, and the following week a Series 7. So a good opportunity to knock out uh, those exams if you need to. I've been wanting to have guests besides our always very special guest, Brian Lee, uh, some different guests. I'm pretty excited that next week uh, we'll have our Q&A afterwards, but the first part of our meeting will be Doug uh, Vincent, who's the Vice President Kaplan, sharing with us some of the new changes they've made uh, to the Kaplan uh, experience. Uh, I don't know what they call it, but they've revamped backstage, kind of a little freaky when I go backstage and it looks much different, but I think it's going to be some very positive changes for test takers who are using Kaplan content. Uh, the best free supplement to your paid study materials is my YouTube channel. But if you're looking for a paid supplement uh, and you don't have a Kaplan QBank, I highly recommend it. The 15% discount code for all Kaplan products and services is Guru15. And uh, Brian uh, Lee, Test Geek Exam Prep LLC, uh, has been kind enough to give our viewers a 20% discount on all his products, and that is Guru20 is that discount code. If you do miss one of these live streams, it is available as a podcast, both on the YouTube channel and on Spotify afterwards. We are broadcasting to Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, our preferred platform, and X. If you're using my channel, there's a lot of content there. And boy, talk about attitude of gratitude. Thank you so much. Uh, this week, the channel crossed unbelievable 800,000 watch hours. I don't know if that's one test taker watching 800,000 hours or 20 watching 40,000 hours apiece, but incredible. We also uh, uh, passed three and a half million views. So uh, thank you so much for that. Now, the channel does have a lot of content. And so one thing I would recommend is if you're looking for how to best uh, be efficient in it, Go to your series uh, exam. If you're taking the SIE, for example, there are three XI, SIE playlists. They're in suggested watch order. It's a buffet. Take what you like, leave what you don't. If you're looking for a particular topic, go to the channel search bar and put in parity or intrinsic value or crude interest, whatever that may be. And if you enter that in the channel search bar, then everything we have content-wise will come up on that. So that's how I would make best use of the channel. We end our... A uh, weekly live stream with a coaching call drawing. It's a 30-minute coaching call. It's not a floating contingent liability. So if you win within one hour, you send me your email. I send you the Zoom link, and it would be March 14, 3 p.m. It is recorded. It is shared. You can uh, assign it to someone else. You can share it, whatever you'd like to do with it. All right, let's see what we got going on in, uh, in terms of content questions. Let me get rid of that. Series 65. Series 65, does the de minimis rule apply to federally covered advisors? It does not because they don't need it. As a federally covered advisor, I don't need to worry about de minimis. As a federally covered advisor, I can have as many clients as I want in any state I want and not have to register unless I have a place of business. So de minimis, to answer your question, only applies to state covered advisors and investment advisor reps of state covered advisors. So again, very important when you're reading your test question, are they asking you about a federally covered advisor or state covered advisor? Because the answers will be different in terms of the flow from that. And are they an investment advisor rep 
of a federally covered advisor. Again, because once you hear federally covered, de minimis isn't an issue, right? If it's state covered, then it could be. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, what tests are needed for a relationship banker? I'm a current banker. I have no idea, Tara, because that depends on your bank. If you're selling traditional banking products, then you don't need any securities. It depends what you're doing. If you are selling securities products off the banking plat plat platform, most bankers who are securities registered to sell securities would either have a six or a seven. If they have a six, that means they can sell mutual funds by application, period, full stop. You know, mutual funds in the primary market. If the banker has a Series 7, is registered with a Series 7, that means they're a master of disaster, jack of all trades, master of none. They can pretty much get people involved in anything other than commodities, you know, futures. And that's a Series 3. So uh, I'm not somebody who is at your firm. So you would have to ask your bank what their broker dealer subsidiary requires or if they're using a third party. It's typically going to be a 6 or a 7. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, series seven question, taking the series seven next Tuesday, hardest for me, uh, Kaplan materials, unit 16 types of orders and quotations. Well, good news. I will link in the video description to a video on both of those topics. But for here, I got good news for you. If you tell me that you missed the test Tuesday, you missed your mark because of orders and quotations. I'm going to say you had bigger problems elsewhere. Should you know what a market order is? Yes. Should you know what a limit order is? Yes. Should you know what a stop order is? Yes. Should you know what market not held means? Yes. Should you know the bid and the ask and from whose perspective and the size of the quote and what is called if a market maker fails to honor a firm quote backing away? You certainly should. Uh, that is in function four of FINRA's content outline. So if you go to the uh, Kaplan FINRA website, which I highly recommend, and you print the FINRA Series 7 content outline, it will tell you the breakdown of how many questions are in each section. And section four, I believe, is like 14 questions, and that includes margin. By far, the bigger uh, section is function three, which is uh, you know investment vehicles. So how worried should you be? I don't know. I think between now and Tuesday, Mr. 529 CP, I guess I'm, I'm guessing that means college planning. You're talking about a 529 plan, I would think. But anyways, I would tell you there's no reason for that to concern you because you certainly should be able to put that into the intellectual ownership category between now and next Tuesday. So, you know, there's no reason to be worried about it, but you certainly have time to fix it. It shouldn't take you long to, to fix that. Uh, series 66 question. Can you help me uh, understand what makes advisors? Well, I have no idea, Dr. Zoom Zoom. I need more, more. Uh, context than that. I don't know of any test content on 66 about a $25 million asset under management. Uh, the numbers that you need to be aware of for the 66 are 100 million, 100 million or more. You can choose whether to be state or federally covered. 110 million, you belong to the feds. An investment advisory firm never registered with both the SEC and the state. It's one or the other. I have a lecture called Who's Your Daddy? And that's what that's about. So without context, I'm not sure what you mean makes them special. I have no idea what you mean by special. Uh, by the way, let's just be clear. If you give investment advice, you're in the business of giving investment advice and you are expecting compensation, you're an investment advisor, you need to be registered as such. Uh, taking the 66, I switched from SDC to Kaplan. Feeling overwhelmed with such more and more content. Well, that's a, a good thing. Abundance is better than scarcity. I mean, STC is a fine provider, but, you know, they're a lot thinner in terms of uh, content. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I mean, but you can easily memorize the STC QBank, which is a bad thing. You can't do that with Kaplan. Uh, can you go over annuities and who they're suitable for versus mutual funds? Well, I, I can. Again, this is a live stream. I will link to a, a lecture. I wouldn't worry at all about fixed annuities. Right? Fixed annuities aren't securities products. But I would worry about variable annuities. I think of Leslie, don't tell your compliance officer I said this, but I think of variable annuities as a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. A mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. Now, the neat thing about the insurance wrapper is you don't get constructive receipt of capital gains and dividends. 
you must reinvest them into the separate account. The separate account is where your money goes. In a fixed annuity, Leslie, if you uh, you know put five hundred thousand dollars into a fixed annuity, that five hundred thousand dollars would go into the mutual fund, excuse me, the insurance company's general account, and they would make investments. They would buy stocks and bonds and real estate, and they would hope to pay uh, make more than they promised you. And in a fixed annuity, the investment risk is assumed by the insurance company. And uh, you say, Dean, I figured out what those bastards have been doing, man. They've been taking my money and making more than they promised me. I say, Leslie, first major test question. Are you willing to assume investment risk? In a variable annuity, the investment risk is assumed by the annuitant. You shouldn't even consider a variable annuity until you've maxed out all of your other retirement plan options. We refer to this, Leslie, as a non-qualified plan meaning it's not coming through your employer and the funding is going to be after tax. So uh, maybe I'm talking to Coco Graff, you know, or Goff, I think, right? The tennis player. I say, Coco, you can't possibly spend all the money you're making. Why don't you give me a million dollars after tax to put into a variable annuity? So that's a million dollars. She's already paid taxes on. We're going to put that in a mutual fund, a separate account or sub account. She's assuming the investment risk. She's going to buy uh, units instead of shares. They're called accumulation units. So my example, she gives me a million. That's her cost basis. Cost basis is simply when you turn the money into the investment. So she's got a million dollars in there. Uh, it's in a separate or sub account, a mutual fund with that insurance wrapper. And like other retirement plans at 59 and a half, she can annuitize. You know, she can take a lump sum. She has some choices. Now, one thing that makes variable annuities unique to uh, as contrast with mutual funds is this idea that the money is growing tax deferred. And here's a neat one. If she annuitizes, she could turn uh, this into an income stream that she can't outlive. You know, you can't do that in a mutual fund. Once you start withdrawing from a mutual fund, it's not magic. At some point, you're going to run out of money. You're going to exhaust the account. Now, if she says, hey, Dean, I'd like to do a random distribution for that. How much do I have now? She's 59 and a half. I say, Coco, the separate account now has $10 million in it. Now, had she put a million dollars in the Vanguard S&P 500 index mutual fund, again, a million dollars after tax, it was 10 million. That 9 million would be taxed at or at, uh, as a long-term capital gain. Not here. If she says, Dean, send me a million or 2 million or 3 million or 4 million, that's going to be taxed at ordinary income tax rates. And last money's in, test question, our first money's out. So what I mean by that is, in this example, she's got $10 million. She I send her a million. That's a million of the nine she hasn't paid taxes on. She won't get the million that she put back there until the end. Last money's in, first money's out. If you get stuck, always guess what yields the most of the U.S. Treasury. Right. So LIFO is very testable. If she annuitizes, she has some choices. And the one that will give her the largest check is life only. So uh, I'll link to a video where I go over that. All those things I said are testable. I would also know about the assumed interest rate. Once we annuitize, we turn the accumulation units into annuity units. And that's going to go up or down based on the air. So I hope that was helpful for you. And I'll link to an entire video on variable annuities that you can watch at your uh, leisure. Uh, 66 on the 23rd, Nico, I'm so excited for you. I know you're going to take out this last leg of your testing journey. I'm uh, excited for you. Uh, just got off uh, work. Let's go, Dean. My test date's April 23rd. Uh, Daniel, I've been uh, seeing your activity on the channel. And so I think, again, I can see the work. And again, I think like Nico, I think you're going to take that thing down. I think you're going to make your mark. Uh, Isaac, I don't know if you're here. I haven't seen you in the chat. I did receive your email and I did get permission from STC for us to do a STC shared screen final. So if you are in there, uh, I'll send you an email after this. 66 on Thursday. All right. Sending you good test vibes. Uh, 66, Dr. Zoom Zoom. What level of risk aversion aligns with investing in the S&P index fund? Well, the way they would ask that, Dr. Zoom Zoom, is about the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, theory isn't true. Theory is just a way of explaining things. And the more a theory can explain, the better that theory is. And we have this concept called modern portfolio theory. 
And we have what's called beta, and beta is a measurement of volatility. You know, for test purposes, we can say that risk aversion is about variance and volatility. And if you're going to take that risk, you should be compensated for it. So the test question about S&P index fund is that it has a beta of one. Whenever we're talking about beta, we're talking about as compared to the market, the market being the S&P 500. The other thing is anything in excess of that is called alpha. And if you're seeking alpha, you do not believe in excess returns. You don't believe, you know, excuse me, don't believe in efficient market hypothesis, right? If you're seeking alpha. So to say that you're seeking alpha excess returns is the antithesis of what we call the efficient market hypothesis. So this is how the index fund comes up as well on the test. You say, Dean, I think this uh, trying to beat the market is a waste of time and resources. You know, I don't think you could beat the market even if you tried. You know, I believe it's more like a random walk, like a drunk walking down the street and you never know which way he's going to go. That's how I feel about the market. And I said, well, whether you know it or not, you just articulated what's called efficient market hypothesis. And if you're willing to ac accept a market-based return and you want to minimize the cost structure, you want to maximize tax efficiency, then we should recommend an S&P index fund. So again, I don't like the level of risk aversion because that's not really the way we talk about it because stocks do have risk. And so you certainly still have systematic risk in an index fund. Risk prevails despite your diversification. I'm trying to say that a stock fund is much more risky than like, uh, you know, treasury securities, for example. So again, I would need context again, Zoom Zoom, about the context of the setup in terms of data gathering. This is called your know your customer. So again, uh, low risk, but willing to accept the risk of the stock market is, I guess, how I would answer that without additional information. Uh, past the 66 last Friday, first time around. Woo! <laughs> Victorious test taker in the house. So, uh, B. Newman, if you'd be so kind, I don't know why people wouldn't want to believe me about what's on the test. I mean, I've helped tens of thousands of people pass the test over the decades. But if you don't believe me and you want confirmation, uh, we have a Victorious test taker in the house. Now, remember, every draw is different. I'm wishing for all of you a dream draw. Everything you studied shows up. You go, I don't know what the big deal was. Uh, but we got to be prepared to take down any draw, including a face of death draw. So, B. Newman, what did you think about your draw? Did you think you got a face of death draw or did you get a dream draw? You know, again, the draws are completely random. They're completely random. Uh, I'll be testing in two weeks, Benita. Two weeks for the six. Should I max out the cap on Cubic? Come on. I'll, I'll, I'll throw this to the chat. What do you think Dean is going to say about what, to a test taker who says, should I max out the Kaplan Q Bank? What do you think the answer is going to be? Yes, there's a direct correlation between the Q Bank usage and passing the test. Benita, if I have a backstage pass to your Kaplan site, you know, corporate trainers do. And if you miss your mark, the first thing I'm going to do is go backstage and punch it up and see what your QBank usage rate is. And almost always when somebody has missed the mark and we go back to look at their QBank usage rate, it's a low number. So my answer is absolutely, absolutely. You should not take, answer your second question. You shouldn't take more than one practice test a day. You're trying to get a mark. And if you do, like I got the other day, I did four today. I said, what a waste. Because that fourth mark is not going to be accurate. We're trying to get a mark. We're going to do a test. We're going to get a mark and we're going to do remediation. So I say no more than one a day. Today I did a tutoring session and I told him, I think one every other day would be acceptable. You know, I just wanted you to commit to how many you're going to do and then remediation, right? About You should be doing practice tests more and more as you get closer to your date. So two weeks out, you know, seven, 10 days, we should be expecting to do three or four. I'd like you to be in the mid 70s. You know, higher the better, but mid 70s means we have a margin of safety. You know, I have people get between 60 and 70 pass, but that's not where we want to be. I had somebody today, they told me they got a 40. I said, there's no way you're going to pass. I mean, you haven't laid enough base knowledge if that's where you're at. B, I'm not sure what B, oh, B. <laughs> what's the difference between fraud and unethical business practices? Oh, well, the difference is fraud, I can go to jail. Being unethical doesn't land me in jail. Because, well, Dean, I don't think that was ethical. 
you know, like, you know, you, I cut the line or something. Yeah, you, know, you say, Dean, that's unethical. You know, you didn't, you're supposed to wait in line. So the difference between fraud is intent and fraud by statute is criminal. Unethical business practices, you don't go to prison for unethical business practice. You might get your registration revoked, but, you know, I'm simplifying, which is my job, but, right? Nobody is in state or federal prison for selling dividends or making breakpoint sales. Those are unethical business practices. You know, there are people in jail for committing fraud, you know, for, for selling unregistered securities, for example, right? So and that's the difference. Under federal state law uh, on a solicitor, what's the rule on registering as an investment advisor? Well, uh, federal investment advisors can use broker dealers as solicitors and broker dealers who are soliciting on behalf of a federally covered investment advisor do not even need to be registered in as an investment advisor. So let's say I'm a Carlisle, I'm a federally covered investment advisor, I'm managing billions of dollars. I can hire Goldman Sachs to go out and find me investment advisory clients. Goldman Sachs in that role does not need to register as an investment advisor. State investment advisors cannot use broker dealers as solicitors. So if they have somebody who's soliciting for them, those uh, persons who are doing the soliciting, natural persons need to be registered as investment advisor reps. Uh, I like to go with strong and weak first. So that's the way Justin and I answer the question about efficient market hypothesis. This is very testable. Strong form means nothing works. Nothing. Everything that could be known is known. And again, a waste of time to try and, uh, you know, outperform uh, the market. Uh, weak form. I like to go to the other side. Uh, weak form means technical analysis doesn't work. Right? Because that's information that everybody else has. Semi-strong says there are exceptions. Right? For example, if you believe in strong form, you believe that Warren Buffett is a statistical anomaly because he has outperformed the S&P 500. And semi-strong would make a, an exam, say, okay, I'll make an exception for guys like Warren Buffett. Semi-strong, what they're looking for on the test is that inside information could work, material, non-public information. The takeaway from the efficient market hypothesis, the test question is strong form and what Dr. Zoom Zoom asked us earlier, that if you believe in strong form of the efficient market hypothesis, we're still going to recommend that you invest in the stock market because test question, it is a very good inflation hedge over the long term. But we would recommend if you are uh, believe in this, an index fund, an index fund. I haven't had anybody just in years tell me they've had to distinguish between UGMA and UPMA. The test questions are the same. Uh, with Uniform Transfer to Miners Act, test question, one miner, one custodian per account. This is testable on every exam. One miner, one custodian per account. You can have multiple donors, but only one donee. Test question number two, the tax, kid's tax ID number goes on the account. Test question number three, no margin. No margin. So those are the three test questions about Uniform Transfer to Miners Act, Uniform Gift to Miners Act. There's only one state that is foolish enough to still be using UGMA. UGMA, you can stipulate up to the age of 25. So there are no test questions about the distinction between the two. I know vendors give you those questions, but not the test. The test is no one one on one, one minor, one custodian per account, kids tax ID number, no margin. Uh, what type of questions of total return will be on the 66? Well, it could be both. I mean, it could be both. You know, the only two ways you could make money in an investment is the income stream and or price appreciation. Those are the two ways you're going to make money. So if you make an investment and there's no income stream, like you buy raw land or you buy a stock with no dividend, the only way you're going to make money is to sell that to someone else for more than you originally paid. And on the other hand, if you buy an investment that has an income stream, oh, like a stock with a dividend, then there's two ways perhaps to make money. The dividends, you know, so I buy Bank of America stock, Bank of America stock, pays me a 21 cent quarterly dividend. So that's 84 cents a year, I'm gonna get an income. And I might get lucky and Bank of America may go up. So total return would be the income I make on the investment, plus or minus the price appreciation or depreciation divided by what I paid for the investment. 
By the way, if you can't decide what to do on any of these tests, hit the divide key. I'd be doing you a service to mask every key on your calculator except the divide key. If you're not dividing, you're doing the wrong math. If you can't remember what to divide, take the first number, divide it by the second number. So in my example, uh, let's say I bought Bank of America for 25. Uh, I got uh, held it for one year. I get 84 cents of dividends. I sell it for 27. So I made $2 on the stock, 84 cents on the dividend, 284 divided by 25 is my total return. Uh, 50 dream, 50 death. <laughs> Five times. Okay, that's a little on the high side. B. Newman is telling us, uh, I usually say three to four times you're going to have to use your calculator on 65, 66. I think people go down rabbit holes on the math. And if you're not a math person, I don't think you should be going down rabbit holes on discounted cash flow and dividend discount models and present value and future value. You know, stay on the broad avenues and highways like working capital, current ratio, ASHID test, that kind of thing. And I usually tell people three or four. I have, Please note, I did say total return is testable. There's one, right? So that could be there. So I think three to, three to five is about right. I'd be surprised if you have to use it more than that. So there you go. 52 take. Yeah, Blake, I don't know who you're using. Solomon has been purchased by, uh, you know, uh, Past Perfect. But uh, Solomon used to offer a 52 course and currently using Past Perfect. Well, there you go. So I don't know if Past Perfect. I've tutored people on 52 using Solomon. It was funny. I, I bought Blake the, the Solomon 52 because I wanted to see what the, the, you know, the student like yourself was looking at. And I guess I have a higher profile than I thought because I purchased it. And then Jeremy, he's retired now. He's sold out. But Jeremy called me, sent me an email. Hey, D, what are you doing? You're tutoring somebody? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh oh, yeah. But uh, Jeremy's been pretty cool. Solomon refers a lot of their their students to me for tutoring. I guess that relationship will end now that it's uh, part of the past perfect uh, empire. But uh, I agree with you. Any thoughts, um, Blake? I do not. Uh, except make sure you do your your practice questions. Make sure you go to the get the content outline. Look at that, uh, Blake. Uh, I came closest to selling uh, failing the fifty three, which is the MSR Buni principal exam. Uh, and I don't know if this is helpful, Blake, but this would have been extremely helpful to me at the time. The MSRB publishes A rules, administrative rules, D rules, definitional rules, and G rules, general rules. And so, Blake, I would really pay attention when there's like a nominal quote. That's a D rule. A nominal quote, this is testable for everybody. Is an MSRB rule that says nominal quotes are for informational purposes only, right? So stuff like that, you really want to get that minutia down. You should definitely, Blake, note a couple of the G rules. G20 is the gift of gratuity rule. G3738 is pay to play. So really make sure you stay focused on the, the rules. Uh, I would say probably more rule content than actual investment content on that exam. Uh, 60 is the cops. Yeah, it is. Uh, Justin, we at Kaplan, I say we collectively because I'm kind of a senior instructor emeritus at Kaplan. I spent, uh, you know, uh, time as a, a senior member of the Kaplan management team at the predecessor company called Dearborn. Long story short, uh, when we did get scores and Kaplan could track it, the average improvement on a mastery score was anywhere from five to 12. That's the range, test question, the range, right? The data set. 5 to 12 is the average, you know, uh, where people would be in terms of the mastery. So you will pick up a, a points from the Kaplan mastery to the actual exam. I've actually had people score very low on the Kaplan mastery still pass. Don't expect you to do that. But if you got that mid 70, I was telling people I want you to be in the mid 70s. And if you're using Kaplan, and you got a mid 70 on the mastery. I think you're in good shape. You know, uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to teach a class on the campus again. But when I was teaching uh, campus classes is for these corporations at their you know campus, we would have 20 people for the class. Friday, we would take the mastery. They'd be testing Monday. And if we had 20 people in that cohort, I would say to the corporate trainer, I say, listen, we had uh, uh, in our class, we had 12 uh, people uh, who actually got over 70 in the mastery. I don't think they're at risk and I think they're going to pass. We had six people between 60 and 70 on the mastery testing Monday. We're going to lose half of them. She, she said, what half? I go, well, if we knew that, we would intervene, but we don't know. It's just statistics. I don't know. There's no reason for that. They stayed dedicated, disciplined, and organized over the weekend. 
continue to work hard and finish strong, they would all pass. And surprisingly, they all did and they all passed. Wow, that's great. Usually, you know, that 60 to 70 range on the mastery and somebody misses, it's not really that they didn't know it, it's that they got wobbly. They didn't finish strong. Anyways, that leaves us with two people that were below 60. That's almost impossible because that means you have a knowledge deficit problem. You don't even know what you're being asked in the question and you don't know what answers are being offered to you. Now, those two people who did fail, we went 18 for 20. The two people who failed in this uh, example, uh, they got a high 60, which I thought was pretty good. I mean, coming back pretty strong. And then they they tested, they passed. So uh, that's my thought on the Kaplan Mastery. Uh, who receives a re option transaction? Yeah, the call or put writer. If you're selling the call or the put, you receive the premium. And for that, you're obligated. So Yeti, I joke today, I taught teased the person uh, for their tutoring session. They showed up and I said, you've done an opening purchase. You are long the tutoring session. You have a choice. I am short the tutoring session. I've received the premium. I'm obligated. So the answer to your question, if you receive the premium, you're the writer, seller, you did an opening sale. There's lots of words for that, right? So the answer is yes. By the way, that's your maximum gain. You agree to be a potential victim. Nobody victimizes you. Neener, neener, neener. I do a put option on my own personal account and receive the premium. That means you sold the put. So you obligated yourself to buy the stock. And maybe you want to buy the stock. Why not get paid to do something you're already prepared to do? If Apple's at 173 and I'm thinking about putting in a limit order at 172, and instead, maybe I sell a 175 put for four and obligate myself to buy Apple at 175. Today, Apple's 173. My broker calls me, says, Dean, you got exercised. I go, great. I wanted the Apple stock anyway, so I ended up getting it for 171. So you might be selling a put to be able to buy the stock at less than the current market price. Well, call writers also receive the premium. You have two types of contracts, calls and puts. You can either buy them or sell them. So you can be writing a call contract where you're obligated to sell the stock, or you could be writing a put contract where you're obligated to buy the stock. Now, Yeti, if you're taking a Series 7, I'm a little concerned about this question. If you're taking an SIE, I don't really care because I don't think the options will mess you up. But uh, if this is a Series 7, you need to do some more work on that because you should know there's two short positions. You can do an opening sale on a call or an opening sale on a put. Hello, Ivy. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, I think I just answered that, Jared. Did you come late? I said a investment advisor who's federally covered can hire a broker dealer as a solicitor. I gave an example of Carlisle hiring Goldman Sachs to raise money for the investment advisory. Goldman Sachs in that scenario does not need to be registered as an investment advisor rep. If you're a state covered advisor, the person soliciting on your behalf needs to be registered as an investment advisor rep. I certainly can. So Austin, the one bit difference, I don't know if you're taking 65 or 66. And one of the things I think that people bump into on the 66 is a little bit of hubris. And what I mean by that is they feel good. They're coming off their seven testing victory and they go, oh, you know, I already did all this work on this stuff. I already know this stuff. Well, kind of. There are some new terminology or vocabulary that shows up in the 66 and for that matter, 65 that wasn't present anywhere on six or seven. Now, you did get tested on a concept about volatility. And as you recall, when you got tested on volatility on your series seven, it was long and low, long and low, baby. So the bonds with the longest maturity and the lowest coupon are going to have the most volatility. You know, and I get sometimes bond geeks in that class and they go, Dean, I don't really like how you've oversimplified that in a series seven. I said, well, why? And they said, well, you know, that relationship isn't linear and you're making it sound like it's a linear relationship and it's not. So now on 65 and 66, it's the same concept, but now it's called duration, right? So duration is the same concept. The way you answer this on the test, Austin, is which bond has the highest duration? It's a measurement of volatility indeed. And you would answer it the same way. So if I ask which bond has the highest duration, you can just trans translate volatility 
and you would go with the longest coupon, or excuse me, longest maturity and the lowest coupon, right? It's going to be maturity first. It's not expiration. It's called maturity. I'm being a jerk, but the vocabulary is important. There's no such thing as expiration in a bond. It's called maturity. The answer to your question is maturity first and then the coupon. Uh, is there any DPP questions on 66? There could be. Uh, if you tell me you missed 66 because of direct participation programs, I'm going to say, I don't think that's why you missed the mark. Uh, I would know that partnerships, direct participation programs are not liquid. They're not suitable for somebody who needs liquidity. I would know that limited partners have limited risk. General partners have unlimited risk. I would know there's a flow through of the tax consequences. But again, it's not a, a big deal. By the way, it's not a big deal on seven either. So if if you're taking your seven, boy, I would tell you, test prep vendors go completely overkill on direct participation programs. I mean, my God, you know, if there, if there were any two chapters that you could just rip out of your license exam manual and not worry about it, it would be margin and partnerships. I always think Brian is a great uh, paid supplement. And remember, Guru 20, you get a 20% discount. Uh, we had somebody buy the, the, Brian's courses and then, you know, in social media, you know, he was kind of having buyer's remorse, it sounded like. And I told him, I said, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, you, you made a good investment, but hey, if you're having buyer's remorse, just call Brian. I'm sure he'll give you a refund. He's, you know, you got good news. My friend Brian is doing very well. He doesn't have to worry about you know, giving you back your money. Uh, broker dealers do not have to file a fee disclosure document. Well, yeah, because broker dealers don't charge fees. We charge fees not for investment advice. But in general, we should know that broker dealers don't charge fees. Nico, we should know that broker dealers make money on transactions. Transactions, commissions, or markups or markdowns, never both, but that's how broker dealers make money. Whereas investment advisors make money through fees, typically an asset under management fee. So, yes. You don't have to do it as a broker dealer because you're not charging fees. So hello, Jackie. Oh, that's a good looking dog. Uh, I can't see how big he is. I'm trying to see if he has like a, a snout. You know, that, it's deceptive. I need to know how big those staircase. I don't think he's a bull mastiff. I think he's too small to be a bull mastiff. And he looks like he's not a great Dane, but he looks like he could be a pretty big dog. Any study group recommendations? Well, here we are uh, in the chat, Jackie. So if anybody wants to form a study group, I'm a very big fan of study groups, but you know, it depends on who's in the study group with you. There's a Facebook group, uh, FINRA. Uh, Ken has one, FINRA with help. I forget what it is. I think it's called FINRA with help from Capital Advantage Tutoring. And they claim they have all kinds of great study groups going on. So you might want to check over there. Uh, there's another one that I'm active in that uh, has people, I don't know if they're doing study groups or not. And I think that one's called Series 65, 66 or something like that. So I know there's two Facebook groups like that. We also have our Reddits, Jackie. If you go to R66 in the Reddit, that's our subreddit. And you could put in the subreddit, you're looking to form a, a study group and maybe somebody will uh, jump on there and do that. Maybe somebody today in the chat will, will uh, you know, uh, jump on that. If you don't want to, you know, when you're in the chat, your, your private business is public, Jackie. But I'll tell you what I'll do. If you send me an email, uh, dean the series 7 guru at gmail.com and just mention you're interested in a study group and anybody else who would like to connect with Jack, if you want to do it through the chat, just send me an email as well, dean the series 7 guru at gmail.com. If I receive that email from you, Jackie, and whoever else responds, I'll assume I have permission to connect you up. And then you guys can, you know, figure out how you want to do it, Zoom or, or whatever. Uh, sometimes when people form a study group, uh, I do accept invitations. I'm not going to lead your study group, but if you, you know, want me to come and do a guest appearance and answer some questions, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, there we go. So there you go, Nico. Boy, I would love to have Nico in my study group. He's a worker, man. So there you go, Jackie. You got your first uh, potential study group member, and that's a good one. Now, I told you, <laughs> I probably shouldn't put out negative vibes, but I haven't in the past had to tell somebody, maybe you need to get out of the study group. It sounds like they're you guys are all just confusing yourselves. <laughs> so. I'm not doing the live stream overtime session tonight, Ivy. Uh, there is one at Dean Tinney, uh, tutoring uh, And I think it's a couple weeks out. Uh, Nico, do you have one currently? I'm looking to join one. So it looks like Jackie Nico wants to join an existing group. So there you go. Uh, Nico said he's got him and two others. So 
Uh, again, I'll leave it up to you guys to hook up or Jackie, if you send me an email, I already have Nico's. And I'll assume Nico, unless I hear differently, that I have permission to forward Jackie's email to you. There you go. Are there any topics? Uh, Amato, I love Amato. You know, I, I got to figure out, Amato, how to make a video uh, for about you. And here's what I love about Amato. So one of my things, my pet peeves, is when people have ghost questions. A ghost question is when somebody says, Dean, somewhere in the materials, there's a question that goes something like, what I love about Amato is he he sends a QID. He says, Dean, here's the question I'm looking at. That's a lot more helpful because then it's easy to kind of answer the question where, you know, if it's a ghost question, it, it's hard to, you know, kind of vanquish it and be done with it because it keeps, you know, popping up in some different form. So anyways, Amato, I think I'm going to make a little short or something. No ghost questions. When you have a question, you know, get the QID. Uh, extra time set myself up on the 66. Yes, Amato. The answer to that question uh, is, uh, yes, focus on unethical business practices and disclosures. Unethical business practices and disclosures on the 66. Uh, oh, series seven, we're oh, seven, you're asking about seven. On seven, yeah, function three, options, munis, and mutual funds. Each of those are 20 plus or minus, meaning you could get more or less, but 20 on options, 20 on munis, 20 on uh, mutual funds. So that's where I would spend my time on Series 7. That's 60 of the 91 questions in Function 3. That's about half the exam. So that's the answer to that question. Uh, similar to overlearning options? Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, the Series 7 questions on options are going to be add in uh, more strategies. You didn't have any multiple or advanced option strategies on the SIE. You are going to have advanced option strategies, spreads, and straddles on the Series 7. So absolutely. How does an investment advisor incorporated in California? I don't like the word incorporation because that has nothing to do with answering the question. They could be a partnership. They could be incorporated. They could be an LLC. That's, you know, that's not pertinent. Is a home office in California? Because now that becomes an issue because they are going to be, you know, registered uh, perhaps in California, perhaps not. Again, Nico, you haven't told me if this is a federally covered investment advisor or not. Uh, fails to inform its clients of the departure of a chief financial officer who did not have an equity position in the firm, not a violation of the Uniform Securities Act. Well, it depends if the chief financial officer's departure was material information, something, Nico, that would have altered your decision about whether to invest with us. If it's immaterial, like, you know, it's just, uh, you know, he's going off to work at some other firm. We got a new guy on tap. It's in the normal course of business. The answer is no. So I would like to have more context. I, in the context of this question, he didn't have, he or she didn't have ownership. And so that isn't a change in control and it's not a change in partnership. And so I would have said, uh, this is not a violation unless there was a language that said it was material. Like there's some dispute he's had with the management team or something like that. Uh, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Dean, I passed my 66, woo -hoo! Another test taking uh, victory. All right. I love it. Debrief email. Th thanks so much. I appreciate it. I'm not allowed to ask you. Don't tell me, not, no, Romy, like what was question 35, but you can say, hey, Dean, I wish I would have spent more time on this or you would have spent more time in your videos on that. Uh, that's uh, really helpful. Thank you so much. Oh, oh that hurts, Madison. That hurts. Uh, failed by uh, five points. I'll link, Madison. I have a video uh, podcast episode. You failed. Is it over? Spoiler alert, the answer is no. And I have five recommendations about how to respond to that misfortune. And so I'll link that in the video description for you, and you can check out that episode. Uh, once I'm done, I'm going to reread read the book. I like it. And do practice questions. Is that good? Yeah, well, I, I would mix it up. So, I, you know, read the book, do practice questions. I don't see practice tests in there. I'd like to see practice tests at some point, get some scores, do some remediation. And uh, I would uh, maybe watch some videos too, right? We watch some videos. No worries, no worries, Austin. No worries. You know, I, like I said, I'm kind of being a jerk, but the vocabulary—it's kind of like learning a foreign language. This stuff, and they say when you dream the foreign language, that's when you know it. So I guess when you have your first uh, NASA exam dream or FINRA dream, that's when you know it. Right? So. 
Uh, taking the SIE on Friday, I feel confident in passing. Uh, I, I, listen, Tim, I love it. I can't prove it, but confidence is worth 10 points at least. Tim, one of the things I always say to people when they're testing is my last kind of bon chance mon ami. I say, hey, listen, be confident, Tim, in the study plan you've executed. Be confident in yourself. And most importantly on Friday, be confident in your answers. Do not be changing answers. You know, stick with what you know. Don't be, you know, trying to overthink it. The, the, the thing you don't want to do is use your own brain to outsmart yourself. So, you know, some of us are too smart for our own good. We're our own worst enemy. I had somebody, Tim, and oh, my God, she gave me this beautiful answer. It was wrong. But it was beautiful. I mean, it was intellectually coherent. I said, where did, where was any of this in the question? <laughs> she was, you know, uh, open and closed in funds. That's very, very testable on every exam to be able to con contrast open and closed in funds. I have a lecture, Tim, I'll link to it. And I, in that lecture, I have a slide that is so target rich. It goes through each and uh, open and closed and just tells you all those differences. So that is very, very testable. You need to be able to contrast an open-end fund with a closed-end fund, the biggest contrasting point is open-end funds are continually offering new shares to the public. Closed-end funds trade supply and demand in the secondary market. They are mutual funds. I'm not sure about the and mutual fund thing because both open and closed-end fund are called management investment companies. Uh, by the way, the other thing you got to be able to do is contrast him an open-end mutual fund with an ETF, an exchange-traded fund. So uh, focus on the uh, the link I'm going to provide you in the video description. Uh, P.S. Again, Tim, you can also on my channel. It looks like you're joining us from uh, YouTube. But if you just put in open end fund or closed end fund, uh, all the content I have available come up. And there's quite a bit because it's very testable. Medium size. All right. <laughs> yeah, It's hard to tell. He looks like a good looking dog, though. I like him. I like he's got his paws over there. I'm a big I I like dogs, though. I'm not as big, much of a cat fan, except big cats as, as I am a dog fan. And I like big dogs. You know, I don't have any dogs currently, but I, I've had some good dogs. I travel just a little too much, so I can't wait till I can settle in and get to start building back the pack. Uh, 66, high 70s and 80s on simulated exams. You're good to go, Justin. Good to go. That's fantastic. So nothing to worry about. Just uh, rinse and repeat, stay the course, keep grinding, and stick the landing. That's excellent. Uh, real estate and IRA, is it permissible? It depends on your custodian. Uh, I don't think they're going to ask you about that on the test, but it depends on the custodian. Some custodians allow real estate. Some custodians do not. Some custodians allow it if it's commercial real estate, not residential. So it depends on the custodian. Uh, the yard, I think, is not permitted since it's part of a collectible. Again, it depends on the custodian, the firm, but I don't know of any firm, reputable firm, that would let you put art into your IRA. I think the number one thing we put into an IRA is cash. So what do you put in IRA? Cash. And then what do you do with it? You buy a mutual fund. You can buy other things, but that would be the number one answer. What goes into an IRA? Cash. What do you do with it? Buy a mutual fund. Uh, P.S. You have to have earned income to fund it. Uh, real estate is allowed in IRA, but you have to be careful. Uh, again, I told you it depends on the custodian. Uh, you receive benefit. There you go. Yeah. And again, Dr. Zoom Zoom, there are some custodians that do not allow real estate. So it depends on your custodian. By the way, the ones who give you more flexibility charge you a lot of money. <laughs> so I used to use a custodian. I would tell my clients, I'd say, man, they're really, really expensive, this custodian. But oh my God, they are so great when it comes to customer service and flexibility and worth that. Uh, I don't think so, Zachary. But if you do, cryptocurrency, uh, the test question is if are you selling the cryptocurrency? as a medium of exchange, are you selling it as an investment opportunity? The concern that the state administrators have and the SEC is if you're selling the cryptocurrency as an investment opportunity, then it needs to be registered as a securities offering, right? So they've said that Bitcoin is not an investment opportunity. Uh, Bitcoin is a, you know, commodity, it's a asset class. But there's other ones, you know, Ethereum, I think they're getting ready to do an ETF on that. Uh, both NASA and uh, the SEC have lost a lot of court cases. And I think one of the reasons for the big run up in Bitcoin is that uh, ETFs, particularly from BlackRock and Fidelity, are collecting billions of dollars in their ETFs that have Bitcoin in them. So 
um, yeah, I don't, I haven't had any sightings yet, but when I, when we have a sighting, I think it's going to be this idea. Is it a security or not? You're welcome. Uh, I want to know how testable futures and forwards are. There's a couple. Uh, the test question is mainly about a beauty contest between futures and forwards. And in this beauty contest, the forwards are always the better answer because forwards are exchange regulated. They have specifications in the contracts. So it's always going to be the forwards are better than uh, futures are better than forwards. Excuse me. So futures are better than forwards is how that comes out as a test question. Because you don't have, you have an exchange, you don't have contraparty risk, all that kind of stuff. And then it's pretty simple. I don't think you need to fill it out, uh, figure it out, Charlie, but it's actually simpler than options. You either think the commodity is going up or down, like soybeans, right? If you think it's going up, you go along the soybean futures, not the forwards, because again, forwards would have counterparty risk. If you think soybean futures are going down, you go short the soybean futures. Uh, regarding custody, uh, there is no net capital net worth for a federally covered uh, and buy. No. When you go, there is no net worth requirement for a federally covered investment advisor. Period. Full stop. There is no net worth requirement for federally covered investment advisors. The 10K and 35K is only for state covered advisors. The 35K is for custody. Uh, well, in S Corp, it's because you have the flow through like you do in a limited partnership, but you actually are a shareholder. You have more control. So the first broker dealer I worked for was an S Corp and Mr. K is our majority shareholder. He's not a general partner. He's a shareholder in S Corp. The tax consequences are the same. They flow through. Now, if that was a partnership, the limited partners would have no say. They wouldn't have any votes about what's going on. Uh, I don't think that would be the test question. I've never had anybody on debrief tell me they've seen that as a test question. The test question would be this idea that an S Corp and partnerships have a flow through. The test question on the S Corp is you can't have more than 100 shareholders and none of them can be aliens, right? So. If I have a FINRA NASA nightmares, what does that mean? That means, well, we're going to have to turn that around. Right? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I said a dream, not a nightmare. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we can. Uh, I guess it's good because that means your brain is processing. I'm going to say it's good because and here's why I'm going to say it's good. That means, Austin, your brain is working on it. And, you know, your, your brain is at its best just before you go to bed and when you wake up. So if you're going to do like a data dump sheet, the best time to try and flush that out is just before you go to bed. Have your model one and then look at what you did and then look at it, what you missed and then go to bed. And when you wake up, do it again. And if you do that every night and every morning, that's when you're at your best. Your brain will pick it up pretty quick. Uh, no, you won't. What they do, somebody asked me this earlier, Jonas, in uh, social media. No. What they do is they remove questions about that and then they reintroduce them later as experimental questions before they start testing again. So you won't see any questions. What will happen is settlement questions will be removed and then they'll be re reintroduced as experimental questions. It usually takes months for that to happen. So the answer is no. Uh, do you have a specific topic such as options, UIT? I have all that. So just go into the channel search bar and put in options. There's 143 videos, Yeti. They're in suggested watch order. The first three are the most important. It's a buffet. Take what you like, leave what you don't. Put in unit investment trust. Everything I have will come up. All right, so the channel is uh, self-serve. There you go, 65. So I have three, 365 playlists. I have a playlist that's lectures. Or, you know, I have a playlist that is a podcast series that Brian Lee and I did. And I have a playlist that is a practice test and practice questions. Who you can take loans from? Well, you can take a loan from a bona fide lending institution. A bona fide lending institution going through the normal loan process that anybody would go through. Uh, family members, if that's a pre-existing relationship, it doesn't apply to your immediate family members. Unless sometimes, you know, they have like a trick question where your family members have a claim of the firm. Uh, what would constitute custody of a client's account under the Investment Advisors Act of 1940? It would be, uh, do I have possession or control? So I would need context on that, Nico. They have to give you context about what is constitutes custody. And it's basically, do I have access to the monies or securities? So, you know, I would need context. Uh, Kaplan, I told you mid-70s, uh, Trey, is where I'd like you to be, mid-70s. 
mid seventies. Isaac, I did get permission from STC to uh, do a shared screen final. So uh, let's get together. I got your email today and we'll figure out a time and place that works for that. Well, time and place, the place we know is going to be Zoom. Study partner in Virginia. So there we go. So Yeti, I think you said you're taking what, the 65 or 66? 65. There you go. So Yeti's looking for a study partner in Virginia. All righty. So it looks like our hour is up. How time flies when we're having fun. And uh, if you want to uh, be in the running for the coaching call, you need to enter into the uh, chat uh, just as it reads on my screen. So let me go back and get you guys. Present, share screen. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, hold on. I got to move this over here. Boom, boom, boom. Try that again. Come on, Dean. All right. Can you see uh, the screen here? Let me get rid of my banner. Do, do, do. Yeah, let's get rid of that. All right. Let's get rid of Yeti's comment. And you need to put coaching call into the chat if you are interested in uh, winning the coaching call. Within one hour, you need to send me an uh, email claiming your coaching call victory. So if you want to participate in the coaching call, put coaching call just as you see it on the screen. Uh, it doesn't increase your odds to enter it more than once. Don't put a space. It's got to be exactly how I have it on the screen. Uh, what type of taxation questions are encountered more often on the 65? Well, uh, it's related to the various investment vehicles. It's tied to the investment. Nobody expects you to be an accountant, but we do expect you to have a general understanding of the tax consequences of investments. So you definitely should have an understanding of cost basis and sales proceeds and, you know, long term is more than 12 months and stock dividends and stock splits are not taxable. Cash dividends are. So, you know, it's in the context of the investments. I do have a video on taxation called Death and Taxes. No, just death. And so you can check that out. I'll put that in the video description for you. All right. Has everybody got uh, in uh, who wants to participate? All right. Here we go. Let's do the drawing. And the winner is... Hey, Dr. Zoom Zoom. So Dr. Zoom Zoom, send me the email to dean the series 7 guru gmail.com. And I will respond. I may not get you tonight. I got a lot of stuff I got to get caught up in the night, but you'll get a uh, Zoom link uh, for that coaching call. Again, you can, if you don't want to use it, you can give it to somebody else. You can share it. You can do whatever you'd like. All right. Uh, let's see. Go back to me. Let's get rid of that. And let's go get rid of that. All right. Uh, anybody have any last minute questions here uh, before we call it an evening? All right. Well, if not, remember, inch by inch, your exam is a cinch. Yard by yard, your exam is hard. And I'll see you next Tuesday, 5 p.m. We have a special guest uh, for the first part of our session, our next Tuesday. It's uh, Doug Vincent, Senior Vice President of Kaplan. And then the, I'll probably stay over that night because we're going to, he's going to probably need 20, 30 minutes. And then after that, I'll start answering questions and I'll just stay till, you know, on that Tuesday, I'll stay as long as you know, want me to stay to answer questions. All right. Uh, all right, everybody. See you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.